Hello, everybody. This is Bangkok Calling. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today for the second online roundtable of our Malaria Game Changer series. We're going to start more or less on time. So my name is Joost Wagner. I'm going to be your moderator today. And we have an excellent group of experts with us today. I will introduce later. But we also have 250 people registered. So I see that people are still tuning in. So let's give it another 30 seconds to allow a little bit people to, to join us from far and near. I understand that people are coming from all over the world. We have even people from the Americas and from Africa joining us today for our second edition. So maybe I use the time to talk a little bit about the Malaria Game Changer series. This series gathers government officials from the Asia and the Pacific, uh, people who work on malaria programs, national regulatory authorities, manufacturers of malaria commodities, and global health partners, members of civil society, and so on and so on, and of course, interested uh, citizens, and through a webinar discussion, we want to discuss existing and new tools and strategies to advance both health security and malaria elimination in the Asia and the Pacific. So the first roundtable, in case you have missed it, was on diagnostics for febrile illnesses and was held last month. And on your screen, you should actually see also the remaining roundtables that are planned for this year. I think the last two are not scheduled exactly, but they will be in November and December. So please take note of that. In our round table today, vector control tools for the Asia and the Pacific, discussions will focus around a number of key points. So first of all, we're gonna talk about new and existing tools to address insecticide resistance and outdoor biting. We talk about innovative interventions to improve access, including innovative delivery channels. We are talking about game-changing actions across ministries to support effective vector control. And of course, about best practices in the relation of vector control tools. So there are maybe a few comments needed while people logging in about the mechanics of our series. So one thing you always have to be aware of that uh, this round table will be recorded and shared on social media in case you have to log off earlier, you can see it later again on YouTube and other channels. And of course, for our speakers who will be recorded, they have to look good at all times. You as participants can engage with us by writing questions and comments in your chat box. I'm sure all people know by now where the chat box on Zoom is, uh, but your audio and video capabilities are disabled, so you cannot unmute yourself. Um, the discussion will be taking the form of a talk show, if you might be familiar with from various uh, television formats. There will be no presentations, but again, once I shot a number of questions at our speakers. You can make use of the chat box to ask your questions. But again, we encourage you also to write comments during the, the discussion I have with our panelists so that you are always engaged. And understand that our, our audience can even uh, write to each other in their Zoom channel. So um, I think now we are already a higher number. And before we dive now in the round table, I would like to welcome Dr. Leo Brack, who is a senior vector control specialist at Malaria Consortium and technical lead for the vector control working group of Upman. And he will speak about the outcomes of the Upman tech talks. I hope many of you have joined them. If you haven't joined them, you should take note of that. They are excellent. It's an excellent series. And Leo is one of the organizers of this Tech Talks. Leo, over to you. Thank you, Joost. So uh, 
I see my role as, and if I understand correctly, my role is more to create a broader context for the rest of, uh, you know, the talks to follow, the questions to follow. Um, but first, hello everyone. Good day to you, wherever you happen to find yourself. Um, in terms of creating context, I think it's worthwhile reminding ourselves that ever since it was discovered in the late 1890s that uh, malaria parasites are transmitted by uh, Anopheles mosquitoes, for, for the rest of time since now, malaria control has been based largely, overwhelmingly, on vector control. In the first part of the last century, that was mainly larval control by draining of ditches and other breeding sites, spreading of oil, Paris green, and so on. Then we moved through into the uh, post-World War II golden era of DDT, which soon faded, bad publicity, insecticide resistance, and so on. Late uh, uh, in the 1990s and early 2000s, it was a big uh, time for IRS, for, in, for uh, insecticide-treated nets, bed nets, and indoor residual spraying. Uh, using initially uh, synthetic pyrethroids uh, by and large. But uh, ITNs and IRS were a huge success. And uh, we have to take our hats off to the great achievements that, that, that those two strategies and tools achieved in bringing down the global malaria burden uh, by focusing on indoor biting mosquitoes. And that's their downfall to some extent. Uh, and they reach the limits of their real bulk efficacy by around about 2015. So if we now zoom in a little bit to Asia Pacific and we look at the situation here, many of the countries in Asia Pacific are approaching malaria elimination, but they're stuck with this thing called residual malaria, that final little fraction that you can pound and hammer away and apply as many uh, bed nets and IRS as you like, but there's still that fraction that you cannot cover. And that is by and large due to outdoor biting and mosquitoes. So at least in my humble little opinion, I've got five minutes, that's why I'm starting to talk fast now. Um, in my humble little opinion, I think there are four issues that we need to address. Number one, we cannot afford to stop using ITNs and IRS. If we take our foot off the pedal now, we're gonna run into massive resurgence. So we have to continue with those existing strategies. But then number two, we have to look at outdoor biting mosquitoes. I'm very glad to say that at least in my perception, there are a number of excellent products in the pipeline that are showing great uh, promise. And I think of Ivermectin treated cattle, use of ivermectin in humans, uh, where mosquitoes that feed on treated cattle or humans outdoors, they die if properly administered and so on. So ivermectin products uh, have great promise. There's also uh, attractive toxic sugar baited substances that you can apply outdoors, attract female mosquitoes, and they die. Uh, then a whole class, and this I'm really happy to, to have learned about through our VEC, uh, tech talks, uh, is um, spatial repellents that are showing great promises in trials in, in, in Africa and are particularly useful in our forest goer challenges here in, in Asia Pacific. So it's the uh, transfluthrin impregnated bands that forest goers can tie around four trees where they sleep uh, in the middle of that or four poles or whatever. Uh, it does not have it, the, the problems of using a bed net uh, where the people sleeping inside the bed net in a forest situation, uh, you, it becomes too hot inside there. So these spatial repellents are a good way to go. Thirdly is, uh, you know, for residual malaria, addressing that, reaching elimination, we have to improve community participation. Uh, we have to harness that support that communities are able to give to participate in and fully uh, engage in the, the uh, tools that we're applying uh, in, in these uh, remote areas. Fourthly, we need, finally, we need to move away from the silo approach that we had historically and we, it, which worked okay historically 
you know, uh, we need to have solid, good, strong surveillance to identify transmission hotspots uh, where residual malaria is taking place. Then we have to do good in epidemiological investigations to understand the drivers. What is causing that residual malaria uh, to take place there? And then importantly, to bring to bear a package of interventions, holistic, holistically integrated, that includes and incorporates vector control, parasite control, and full community participation. So those four steps but cross-cutting across those are issues like capacity building. We need to uh, have solid efforts and initiatives to improve, strengthen capacity for vector control, uh, surveillance, many other things that go with effective uh, integrated uh, malaria control efforts. And then also sustain funding for research and uptake for research into new tools and uptake of those new tools. And then finally, also advocacy and engaging with national malaria control programs to inform them of latest developments and support them in uptake of uh, recent findings and so on. So I think that's my five minutes up yours. Thank you very much, Leo, for your insights, for your four recommendations and uh, highlighting the cross-cutting topics we have to address to, to end malaria in the world and especially here in the region. Um, I hand over now to Dr. Marie Lamy. She's here with us. Uh, she's the Director of Access and Policy from the Asia Pacific Leaders Malaria Alliance. And I understand, Marie, we are having a new website to launch. Yes, thank you, Joost. Thanks a lot. So firstly, Leo, thank you for this overview. Um, that was very useful to hear from you on what was discussed during the tech talks and, and really to get already uh, an overview of the different innovations that we need to pay attention to if we want to get to elimination here in the Asia and the Pacific. Um, before moving on to, to the VCAP website launch, I just, on behalf of the co-host, wanted to say welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us as well. Uh, it's quite apt that we're having this conversation the same week as World Mosquito Day. Um, we'll be focusing today, delving a little bit deeper into some of the, uh, the tools, the different innovations as well that Leo already mentioned that can help us uh, reduce and if not stop transmission of diseases that are borne by mosquitoes. But um, very importantly, what our panelists will also be focusing on is how to improve timely access to these tools to make sure that they uh, get to the communities at risk in a timely fashion. And that, that's an important component as well um, that involves a number of other stakeholders. And this is what brings me to VCAP, which stands for the Vector Control in Asia Pacific platform. Um, this is a platform that is led by a steering committee of many different experts and partners, uh, many of whom are connected as panelists today, uh, also listening in to, to this discussion, and a platform that is co-hosted by Applema and Unite. Essentially what VCAP is, is a network of stakeholders that are involved in improving access to these vector control tools. So by that, of course, the disease programs, the vector-borne disease programs, but also the manufacturers themselves, uh, and also the regulators that are uh, involved in the registration, for example, of these tools. So the VCAP platform exists now since 2018, and it's really a mechanism to um, identify and to share best practices on access. And so this uh, gives me an opportunity to let you know that the VCAP website that we've been working on over the last few weeks is now live. You can access it uh, at www.vcapnetwork.org and have a little browse around. Um, and I'll just take you through a few of the features. If we could move on to the next slide, please. So the VCAP website is really intended as a, a unique platform where you should be able to find um, easy to understand and easy to navigate information on what vector control innovations um, exist for Asia Pacific and what are some of the be best practices in terms of accessing those. So you'll fi find on the home page a little bit more about what the VCAP platform is. There's a video that we put together to summarize that for you. 
There's also some information on how you can sign up to become a member of the platform, um, receive the notifications whenever we post something new or whenever an event is coming up. Um, and we also, um, we, if we move to the next slide, please. The website also hosts a number of um, different pieces of information that will be relevant to regulators, disease programs and manufacturers. The first is a snapshot, really an, an easy to follow snapshot of different vector control products, existing tools, innovations um, that are available in Asia Pacific that are either already registered in a stringent regulatory authority uh, or already WHO recommended. There's a snapshot of the different categories of vector control products um, and what is the status of those uh, different products within the WHO as well. So all of that is easily accessible through the products page. And then just to draw your attention also to, to the regulation page, we have a number of um, case studies that we have developed and will continue to develop to highlight some of the best practices in terms of uh, regulation of these tools. So for example, we have a case study available on Malaysia and how the Ministry of Health collaborates with the Ministry of Agriculture when it comes to evaluating and, and registering some of these new vector control innovations. And if we could move to the next slide, please. On the website, you also get a, an overview of different events that are coming up. Um, we're looking to really have this as a living platform with different opportunities for the, the different members of the VCAP uh, platform to interact and exchange information. And so we'll be posting information on upcoming webinars that will be hosted on that platform. And you'll also have access to a forum with different discussion boards where you can raise questions pertaining to access to vector control products or um, uh, read up on different discussions that our members have been having. Um, so, so that's the quick introduction. Uh, strongly encourage you to, to have a look after this session if you're interested. If you have any comments or questions, you can always write to us as well at vcap at applemart.org. Um, and I'll just stop here and uh, wish you a really fruitful roundtable discussion. I hope you found this discussion uh, helpful and interesting. Um, so with that, have a good session and I'll pass over to Joost again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Marie. This looks like a very interesting website, and I hope you took note of the link so that you can visit it right away after our roundtable conversations. So I'm going to introduce our speakers in alphabetical order in a second. I just wanted to remind you, once we have started the conversation, we are very keen on hearing your comments and looking for questions. Otherwise, it will be only me asking questions and I'm sure you don't want that. And I would like to remind you, if you have a question to a specific speaker, please mention the speaker first so that we know how to allocate the question. So I will request all our panelists to switch on their webcam. So, and I just go give you a brief introduction because we have eight interesting guest today. So I start with Dr. Afsana Khan. She's currently the deputy program manager at the National Malaria Elimination Program in Bangladesh. She has joined the civil service in Bangladesh in 2006, so brings a lot of experience, of course. And she's also a senior news presenter in one of the most popular Bengali TV channels in the country. So if you feel like you need a new face, maybe we can ask her to take over. Secondly, I have Camilla Burkhardt. She is a senior advisor at the Indo-Pacific Center for Health Security in the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. I think you'll see the backdrop there later. And she, before she joined the Center for Health Security, she was based in, in Papua New Guinea, and she also worked on countries like Solomon Islands. So she has done a lot of work in implementation and policy research in relation to malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV. So welcome, Camilla. Then our third speaker is Joel Eich. He has 18 years experience in public health policy formulation implementation. He is uh, based in Singapore, a trained epidemiologist, and he presently leads the environmental epidemiology research program at the Environmental 
Health Institute, that's a public health research center within the National Environment Agency in Singapore. So he's also involved in the design and evaluation of Aedes Wolbachia technology for dengue control. And I think we're gonna talk about this for a moment in a short while, welcome. Then John Paul is uh, working as a consultant with the Innovative Vector Control Consortium, IVCC, one of our co-hosts today. And he has worked in various global agrochemical companies and vector control products companies in the field of product development and regulatory affairs. And um, I think he has been involved in the mapping of the regulatory landscape for public health products in major Asia and Pacific countries. Welcome, John Paul. Justin McBeath has qualifications in applied zoology and medical entomology for the past 25 years and has worked in many different roles. And he has uh, joined Bayer about 10 years ago in the global team, and he was responsible for the Bayer Malaria Vector Control Portfolio and Strategy. So since 2018, he has also been the co-chair of the Vector Control Working Group of the RBM Partnership and is an active participant in other mechanisms of RVM. Welcome, Justin. Then on behalf of the Malaysian government, I have the pleasure to welcome Dr. Rose Nani Mudin. Uh, she is the consultant public health physician and the head of vector borne disease sector in the disease control division at the Ministry of Health in Malaysia. Over 20 years experience, and I think she more or less has worked as a program manager on most of the uh, infectious diseases and vector borne diseases in, on behalf of the ministry. So internationally, she's also involved in various working groups. So I think she's no stranger to many of you. So Selamat Tatang, Dr. Rose. And um, Dr. Sif uh, Subhanarot, he is a program manager for malaria at the National Center for, for Parasitology, Entomology and Malaria Control in Cambodia, who can't join us uh, physically or virtually live, but he has, uh, we interviewed him and he will be on video for a short moment on two questions. Then over to Takao Ishiwatari. Um, Takao-san is a senior associate at the Environmental Health Division at Sumitomo Chemical Company Limited. And he is there responsible for the vector control business. And he joined the company in 1988 and has a lot of experience in development of new insecticides for household public health and vector control, including SumiShield 50WG and Oliset Plus. And we're gonna talk about this later with him. And then I would last but not least welcome Dr. Tessa Knox, she is a WHO advisor to the Vanuatu Ministry of Health on Malaria and other vector-borne diseases. And she has worked not only for the WHO, but also with academia and private sector. And I think she worked in all parts of the world, Asia, Africa, Americas, and the Pacific. Welcome, Tessa. So these are our guests today. Again, if you want to ask them questions, maybe triggered by the, by the conversation I have with them now, then please mention that in the chat, but we're also interested in your thoughts, insights, comments. So make heavy use of the chat box. And if you follow the chat box, you will also see that one of my colleagues is always trying to add links of, uh, of interesting uh, texts, reports, or website that are mentioned by our speakers. So very well, uh, very important to keep an eye on the chat box. So let's start. So we have heard from Dr. Leo and the Upman Vector Control Working Group on some of the technical needs and recommendations in terms of effectively reducing transmissions. So I suppose we start by just asking our panelists what existing tools and strategies we have in the region we should be aware of that we know that are working before talking more about new technologies. And I would like to turn to Camilla first um, can you please share with us aspects of vector control um, the Indo-Pacific Center of Health Security focuses on in this region? Certainly, thanks, Jost. And uh, before I begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people who are the traditional owners of the land on which I'm coming to you from uh, and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. And it's really a, ple um, a pleasure and a privilege 
to be joining a panel of such distinguished speakers. I'm really looking forward to learning a lot throughout this session. Um, before turning to the specific aspects of vector control that we're interested in and, and focusing on, um, I thought it might be helpful to catch that in a little bit of um, context about why are we interested in vector-borne disease more broadly. Um, when our, the center here, the Indo-Pacific Center for Health Security was first established, um, we were given the mandate to address diseases, infectious diseases, uh, with the potential to cause social and economic harms on a national, regional, and indeed global scale. And there's ample evidence, as many of people who will be listening to this now uh, will know, that malaria and other vector-borne diseases fit into this category. We know that these diseases make up a very significant proportion of the global burden of infectious disease. We know that they're extremely widespread. Um, and we know that, and particularly when it comes to arboviral uh, outbreaks, that they're increasing. We're seeing increasing outbreaks in, in severity and in frequency. Um, similarly, when we look at a range of microeconomic or macroeconomic indicators, um, we know the evidence clearly suggests that a heavy burden of these diseases contributes to significant economic hardship, um, slowing economic development. So we know this is these are threats that um, are increasing and have a very heavy toll on populations. Uh, similarly, when it comes to vector control, we know um, that investments in vector control make a lot of economic sense as coming from a donor agency that has an obligation to do well um, and to, to spend, spend our money wisely. Um, uh, Leo mentioned earlier that, that we know the impact of vector control tools has been really significant um, in terms of driving down vector-borne disease. So it's a really good area to, for us, it makes good sense for us to invest in this area. So what are we actually, that gives you a sense of why we might invest, what are we actually investing in, what are we actually doing? Um, I would say our, our focuses are really can sort of sit in two categories. Um, on the one hand, we are interested in uh, building on what is already working in the re region and, and learning more about developing new, to new tools and new techniques. Um, so we're, we've got a partnership with IVCC, which is co-hosting this webinar, um, working in Papua New Guinea um, and in the Mekong countries. Uh, we're also investing in the World Mosquito Program, working on Wabakia for dengue um, in Fiji, Kiribati, Vanuatu, uh, Sri Lanka, and uh, hopefully a few more other countries um, that are in the WMP portfolio. So that's sort of one camp of, of, of focus in vector control in sort of some of those new, new tools and understanding how tools will work in countries in our region. Um, and then the second area is around technical assistance and building capacity um, through, we have a partnership of a consortium that's led by James Cook University that's working in Pacific Island countries um, and on top of that, of course, we're a, a core donor to AppMen as part of the Apple My AppMen um, partnership that is, um, has a heavy focus on, on building capacity and building the networks um, between people who are working on vector control in the region. So to sort of summarize, you know, we don't have a particular interest or a particular focus in specific vector control tools, um, but what we do want to support is the development of a range of appropriate evidence-based tools that are available across the region and that there are people in all the countries in the region who are able, who, who understand that landscape, who are able to select the right tools to match their particular situation the best way, um, the best way that they can. So we're really about trying to um, create a, a, an environment in which there's the right tools available and the right people to make use of those tools. Thank you very much, Camilla, and thank you very much uh, for Australia to support the fight against malaria. Um, Dr. Tessa, you are joining us from Vanuatu today, and can you tell us a little bit more about what, what vector control tools you are actually currently using in the Pacific specifically? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, so just to start by saying in the Pacific, there are three malaria endemic countries. Uh, we have Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands and Vanuatu. Vanuatu is actually fairly close to elimination. We had under 600 cases last year, whereas PNG and Solomons are facing some challenges. They've had significant increases in recent years. Um, for all of the malaria endemic Pacific Island countries, 
we really do see that the predominant vector control tool that is being used are long-lasting insecticidal nets. Their, use is, their distribution is widespread, though we do know that there are some issues with their usage. Um, there's a lot of very remote areas and islands of the Pacific that are hard to access. Uh, and this really does make the, the cost of a delivered net in the Pacific much higher than other places. But nevertheless, the nets are getting out there, although there, is, there are some issues with how well they're being used. Uh, indoor residual spraying is something that was used in the past and its um, use actually has stopped, uh, stopped over the last couple of years, whereas now we're looking to reinstate it. There's a strong move to reintroduce IRS in Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands to halt the increases that we're seeing to reverse the upwards trends and to accelerate to the targets that are set out in the national malaria uh, strategic plans. But again, um, there are challenges with that. It is quite expensive relative to other parts of the world to get this spraying out to all of the households and the communities that need it. Uh, one of the big drivers for reinstating IRS has also been uh, very high demand from the community. So when we're out in the field, we do, and we're doing the net distributions, we are often here, the communities asking, so why do we not have IRS anymore? It was really good, we really liked it. And so there's a very big sort of pull from the community to reinstate this. Um, and also the malaria program here are very supportive given their past success with it um, to mop up some of the, the transmission that, that's been harder to get at with just using long lasting insecticidal nets. So in Vanuatu, we're hoping to reinstate IRS with the support of Rotarians Against Malaria in 2021. Um, and Solomon Islands and PNG will do the same. But uh, Camilla gave a very nice breakdown of some of the other technologies that are being used across the Pacific Island countries for dengue. So Wolbachia uh, has been used in a number of countries. There is, we're sort of still waiting on the clear evidence base to indicate that that has actually led to a reduction in disease, but certainly there does need to be something more done about dengue with increasing numbers of outbreaks um, and increasing uh, mor morbidity that's associated with that across these very small Pacific Island countries that get completely overwhelmed very, very rapidly when you have anything like dengue coming through um, into the countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tessa, um, and giving us a little bit of an update on what's happening in the Pacific. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that we want to make sure that our audience will be able to engage. So keep your answers as short as possible but two or two to points. So however, um, we have still six more speakers and I have two questions for everybody. So let's continue. And we are also joined on this panel by Dr. Afsana from Bangladesh. And I understand she's traveling in the countryside. So very a big thank you for, for making it possible to, to log on. So Dr. Afsana, can you share a little bit more about the Bangladeshi experience, what vector control approaches uh, currently being implemented in Bangladesh and what are the remaining challenges? Over to you. Thank you, Joost, and thank you all the organizer for inviting me. I'm in the countryside right now, um, uh, but uh, I hope you can hear me uh, clearly. Uh, so you are asking that what are the approaches that uh, we are doing for malaria control, actually the vector control approaches we are making, and what are the challenges we are going through? Uh, so currently, you know that Bangladesh is having, um, uh, in, by 2030, we are like uh, going to uh, eliminate malaria. This is our slogan right now uh, with other countries too. So what we are doing, like uh, right now, 19.05 million population is now in, at risk of malaria. And we have 13 districts, uh, which are uh, malaria endemic districts. And uh, the three... All of the uh, uh, cases are coming from the three Chittagong Hill districts are the main uh, uh, cases we are getting from uh, the
100 percent so what we are now using is that the the three l-align long-lasting insecticide nets and uh, the, there are like uh, there in in long-lasting insecticide nets we have like um there are high uh, burden areas we provide them universal coverage for the high burden area people and there are like um, uh, like low burden area and we distributed the LLI with the targeted population and uh, we have like uh, other other measures like um, we have uh, indoor residual spray we also uh, give it to them uh, indoor residual spray it's also like the uh, high burden hot spots where we uh, give them uh, go to the field we and uh, we find if, if it is like one case we identify and uh, for that case we like uh, 500 yards we we do the spraying of uh, uh, of, of the people and there are also um, there are other um, uh, control activities we have uh, that is um, uh, we do the spray mapping like if we found uh, uh, and there are also uh, any anywhere that the lava is there we do the lava mapping and after that uh, we uh, had like uh, temiphos we use that medicine and we uh, uh, spray it uh, there are also another thing it's a vegetation cleaning that means there are bushes uh, the ponds and other things we have this with the people around and we do it the vegetation cleaning and uh, right now we are thinking about like uh, you know the some there are some fishes like guppy fishes or tilapia fishes we we try to uh, do these things also so these are the uh, vector control measures we are uh, actually taking but i'm really appreciate if i have a very if i if, if i have a chance to talk to Leo, uh, because she he was actually mentioning some more interventions on vector control. So I'm looking forward to have a, a chat with him in near future and how we can actually address these things uh, in Bangladesh. Also, you know that we have a really very big burden of people uh, who is suffering, uh, who is uh, in, living in the endemic districts. And there are actually you the, the next question you had, like, what are the challenges we are facing right now? right now is covid and for covid everything stops uh, like cases uh, like the, uh, like uh, in 2019 at this time uh, we had around uh, 7500 uh, cases we identify but this time the cases become low and this is not a good sign for us because mm. uh, we do not know how much people are affected so that's uh, that's actually really um, dangerous for us because the people the workers they they cannot so i think the connection dr afsana is not so good anymore but i think we can talk they about go uh, to the places and they can be the proper PPE and other things and try to I think uh, there is a technical problem, at least on my audio. I can't hear Dr. Afsana. Is this correct? Okay, I think, uh, Dr. Afsana, we we come back to you later. I have another question, and then you call, can maybe elaborate a little bit about the challenges with COVID-19 and also... Yeah. Okay, so um, I would like to move on then, and hopefully we can re-establish the connection with Dr. Afsana later. Um, so maybe let's hear it from our industry representatives and Takao-san, can you tell us more about how Sumitomo Chemical is working with partners in the region and beyond to scale up access to existing vector control strategies? Okay, uh, thank you for your introduction. Uh, I'm honored to have the opportunity to talk in this uh, roundtable panel. First of all, uh, Sumitomo Chemical is committed to continuously contribute to controlling vector-borne diseases through the development and stable supply of high-quality vector control products. Our target is not just limited to malaria, but also about dengue, Zika, and other mosquito-borne diseases. 
Our vector control business is really a global one. And the other Pacific is one of the key regions for us. The smith thomas Chemical has a good product lineup, uh, which covers all of major product categories uh, recommended by WHO, uh, which includes uh, indoor radio sprays, uh, long lasting insect saddle nets, larvicide, and space sprays. We actually have WHO pre qualified products in all of these four categories. And uh, we have been working closely many years uh, and have a good relationship with Upman and Apulma. And uh, uh, we actually a member of the VCAP and the M2030, uh, which was established uh, relatively recently. And we are also working with IVCC uh, for the development and uh, introduction of new vector control tools. Engineers is a good example of the collaboration between IVCC and Mitomo Chemical. As you know, the engineers is a four year partnership led by IVCC and funded by uh, Unitaid. <clears throat> and this uh, helps the efficient collaboration, uh, no, no, efficient introduction of our new product, SmithShield 50WG. And uh, uh, vector control is one of our strategically important business area because uh, we have long recognized that the huge impact of these tools on people and communities. Uh, but the, uh, on the other hand, the high cost of bringing such products to the market, uh, including uh, extensive field and laboratory trials, uh, often complex and time consuming uh, regulatory requirements, uh, it differs country to country and relatively small market size means that it is not always easy for us to keep our business sustainable uh, without collaboration with partners. So uh, I, we would like to continue our good partnership with Apulma, Appleman, and other organizations like IBCC and WHO in order to reduce the burden of or even eliminate malaria or other infectious diseases. Thank you. Thank you, Takasan, for highlighting how important it is for your company to support the fight against malaria and others. And I would like to, to uh, go over to Justin. Justin, what about on your side? What are some of the initiatives undertaken by, by Bayer to support the 2030 malaria elimination goal? Can you highlight some? Yeah, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. And thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to be part of this, uh, this panel. Um, I, I think from our side, maybe, maybe I'll just touch on the, that number of 2030 first before I talk more generally. I think that's, that seems like a long time away, but actually it's not very far away in the context of, of you know, the timelines which we face in some of the development um, pathways of new tools. So I'm going to talk a little bit more broadly about perhaps our, our current portfolio um, and the initiatives which relate to that in the Asia Pacific region, uh, and then talk a, touch a little bit on some of our investments in, in the R&D area, which may, then might lead on to, the, I guess, the next session or the next section of the questions. Um, so I think, you know, in, the, in recent years, we've been very much focused on, um, you know, reflecting a little bit on what, on what Leo was saying in his opening remarks, we've been very much focused on ensuring availability of a, an additional tool set, if you like, in these, in these core intervention categories of IRS and LIANT. So most of our development work is in IRS um, and with recent PQ um, listings for products like Fluidora Fusion, for example. Um, with an emphasis on that, with trying to address or provide solutions which, which address needs of, of resistance management and, and inclusion in rotation strategies of, of, of programs in countries in, along the same lines as Sumitomo, Syngenta, BSF, and others in developing similar similar types of products. Um, so we've also been very much focused, or we are very much focused on this emphasis that I think some uh, Tessa made or somebody made earlier about evidence base. Um, and so, whilst a lot of our focus has been on Sub-Saharan Africa and the introduction and availability of fluid or fusion for IRS programs there, that is expanding for the to the Asia Pacific region now. Um, and we, we approach that with the same mentality of, of generating data and sharing the data which is available. So I think that's that's a sort of an in, in, integral part of our philosophy is that investment into R&D, 
science and understanding uh, the efficacy and the performance of the of the products which we which we develop. Um, maybe I'll I'll touch on then just two other points I think which are relevant within that 2030 timeline is um, investment into production capacity, um, the lead times and the demand which are associated with um, vector control programs are so let's say sometimes quite challenging. Uh, and our experience has been that it's really essential to maintain things like safety stocks and take risk, actually, take risk and maintain safety stocks to ensure that there is reactivity um, possible when or if a short-term demand arises. So that's been a philosophy which we've maintained, and we do that certainly with the, with the new products which we develop. And it's a philosophy, obviously, which we'll try and, try and maintain going into the future. Um, that applies to our uh, formulated products for um, uh, intervention categories like IRS, um, but we also we're also the one of the suppliers of active ingredients to net manufacturers as well, and that's a philosophy which is which is applicable there as well. Uh, and maybe I'll just in there for close, having talked a little bit about our current or new portfolio. Maybe just close with just a comment around the R and D and the new new portfolio. Um, touching on the second point, which, which Leo raised in his opening remarks, is that we are investing at the moment in these areas of residual and outdoor transmission, which we recognise as having particular emphasis and relevance here in the in the Asia Pacific region. Um, and so we've got a quite large um, project in that area, which which we hope would eventuate to uh, a product which would be available to contribute towards that elimination timeline of 2030. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. So I would like now to move the discussion about new and innovative tools and especially about uh, what do we need to better protect our vulnerable communities. So like forest goers in, in for example, in the Asia and the Pacific. So I learned that some innovative package of tools to protect forest workers are being piloted in Cambodia. Dr. Sif from CNM, the malaria program Cambodia cannot join us uh, today live, but we asked him the question and uh, via a pre-recorded video, we have an answer. So I would like to request our um, studio to, to help us to show the video. Right. Um, I guess... Uh, uh, uh... Right. Um, I just uh, 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 tell you that the better control tool in the recent year has been updated from the routine uh, band net distribution using ground lasting insecticide digit net to the forest pack. Because with the recent year, there is a uh, malaria has been, malaria K has been happened mostly um, with the people that go to the forest and also work in the forest. So uh, it, it, we can say that is a hard to recapitulation. That most likely they may uh, the long-lasting insecticide net may not fit fit their contact in order to the protect malaria transmission during their work and and, and so on in, in the forest. So that's why the national program identified that we need a, a, a special tool like forest pack. The forest pack is a content of the, the hammock and also hammock net, and also the repellent, um, uh, some uh, tool of health education where they can uh, access to to malaria services in terms of in term of uh, diagnosis and treatment, and and also in the forest pack also include some other uh, the necessary uh, uh, material like toy, raincoat that can the, the provide the, the everyday the work in the forest. And uh, for the pack, that is a part of the, the, the tool that the, the, the forest grower mostly use routinely in the forest. They, they have no, like example, that we add some repellent inside there because they have uh, work late at night until 10 or so a.m. at night. Some somebody may be later than that, so there is no chance uh, to cover by insecticide uh, net. So that's why we provide repellent to them to protect while they are not uh, inside the net yet. 
and also uh, in the forest to do imagine there is no uh, uh, shelter proper that they can that they can uh, rest so that's why we provide hammock and also hammock net with little insecticide so they can uh, a proper uh, bed for them uh, uh, for this uh, tool so uh, forest pack has been launched in cambodia since 2019 and started the uh, idea discussion since 2018 during the maria has been jumping high in the country uh, compared to the other year and then we can say that uh, the increase of a pfmhk in cambodia but during launching in 2019 until now um, maria pfk has been decreased more than 80 uh, percent uh, by the end of 19. So this is a good news that uh, for the pack has been impact to the, the, the routine better control tool. So we have just heard from Dr. Sif from Cambodia on an innovative way to package different necessities, including personal repellents and hammock nets to protect forest goers from malaria while working outdoors and at night. And I would like to sh shift now to Malaysia. And I think we all agree that Malaysia has done an exceptional job in reducing transmission to zero cases since 2018, Dr. Rose. So in terms of protecting communities from auto biting, what tools are being introduced in Malaysia? Yeah, uh, hi, Josh, and uh, all the distinguished uh, um, uh, webinar. Uh, OK, in uh, the challenges actually um, faced by Malaysia, in terms of controlling malaria is not only for humans malaria transmissions, uh, but also how to control zoonotic malaria transmissions because we are reporting even last year, uh, we are reporting about more than 3,000 cases for zoonotic malaria. Therefore, Malaysia needs to have innovations to overcome these problems and the innovations are use of spatial repellent, uh, residual spray and application of repellent uh, as personal protection. Innovation with uh, spatial repellent uh, is, the, is uh, the use of mosquito coil by the rubber taper uh, where the mosquito coil is put in an aluminum, uh, aluminum container and they will hang the container at their back, bags or back and uh, or while uh, do and they bring this uh, mosquito coil uh, during the rubber tapping activity the spatial repellent is also used widely uh, in dengue prevention and control activity uh, such as uh, the use of aerosol spray uh, electrical mosquito mat and mosquito coil uh, the other innovations to tackle the outdoor biters uh, using outdoor residual spray uh, and also a perimeter spray which we innovate to use in our uh, malaria control especially for zoonotic malaria and also insecticide treated uh, clothes. Uh, since 2016 and 17, the study on outdoor residual spray has been proven able to reduce P. nolosi uh, zoonotic malaria cases in the, in, in the intervention area. And in 2019, ORS has been included in the zoonotic malaria program uh, activity, especially in Sabah. Uh, ORS has shown good results with the reduction of PK cases about 22% in 2019. And uh, from January to August this year, uh, the reduction of PK cases is about 31%. The other innovations um, is the use of insecticide treated clothes for rubber taper and or for people who had related activity in the jungle. Uh, another method used by the Aboriginal people are uh, actually they are using the used uh, uh, nets, bed nets, which already damaged, but there are some parts which is still can be used. So they use this, this undamaged uh, uh, nets to cover the um, incomplete structure area, for example, if there's a hole in the, in the wall. So they're using this. So this is how the innovations met in, in Malaysia. So we also have other innovations such as uh, Wolbachia project uh, for dengue 
and is already implemented in the 17 area and shows a very remarkable results uh, for for redu reducing the dengue cases in our country. Thank you, Dr. Rose, for sharing Malay Malaysia's experience. Uh, we already know from our technical experts in previous discussions we had that the other challenge to reducing transmission of malaria and other mosquito-related illnesses in Asia and Pacific and globally is mosquito resistance to insecticides. So Takao-san, can you tell us more about the different formulations from Sumitomo chemical that could help the region address the issue of insecticide resistance? Yes, insect resistance is, uh, as you know, one of the most serious threats in vector control uh, for malaria or other uh, mosquito-borne diseases. We, we launched a new product, SimiShield 50WG, which is an indoor residual spray uh, containing a new mode of action active ingredient, which is really the first new chemical class in 40 years recommended by the WHO for IRS uses. And having a new mode action makes this product a breakthrough for resistance management program and a real game changer because uh, the, you know, in the past, widespread resistance to pyrethroid or other class of insecticide really limited the opportunity to conduct any insecticide rotation. Uh, that means uh, the most program relying on one IRS product. SmithShield is a non pyrethroid single AI IRS, which therefore fits perfectly with the recommendation by WHO for malaria vector control in G form uh, and uh, other more recently published uh, uh, WHO guideline. Uh, for example, uh, it stated that uh, best practice is to introduce IRS with a non pyrethroid active ingredient or uh, IRS with the pyrethroid should not be deployed in the same household or area as ITN, etc. Semi-shield is pre-qualified WHO and odorless, low toxicity and uh, easy to use, easy to transport. So we believe it's an ideal IRS product for IRM, especially in rotation strategy with other non-pyrethroid IRS. And uh, in addition to IRS, uh, we have a uh, LLIN long lasting sexual net to address insecticide resistance, uh, which is Orchid Plus. The first in class PBO net, it contains synergist PBO combined with pyrethroid. This mixture of pyrethroid and PBO is available on all sides and roof of the net, which gives users all around the protection from mosquitoes attack, attacking any side or roof of the net. We have a lot of evidence of this product entomological efficacy against resistance mosquito. And uh, in addition, this product's enhanced efficacy in reducing malaria transmission have very clearly demonstrated in epidemiological trials. We also have the larvicide, for example, a new formulation of piriproxifen called Similab 2ML, a long lasting larvicide, uh, specially designed for container breeding mosquitoes. So it covers the ADS control and potentially unfair stephansi. It's uh, spread, uh, spreading uh, rapidly across the world. Uh, this product shows six months or longer residual efficacy against container breeding mosquito in laboratory and field. And lastly, uh, in uh, integrated vector management, so-called IBM, is our strategic approach by utilizing various kinds of tools. Uh, however, I hope the stakeholder community to remember that the new insecticides are difficult and very expensive to develop. So new tools should be used carefully to preserve their effective life by following the good IRM, IRM strategy. Uh, despite the significant challenges uh, with help and support from partners like Apumen Apuma and IBCC, we will continue our effort to develop new products for vector control. Thank you. Thank you, Takao-san. And let me go straight to, to John Paul. 
Um, you led the regulatory landscaping study on behalf of the IBCC launched last year. It was funded by the Australian government, by DFAT. So what have you learned in, in terms of challenges to access to some of these new vector control tools? We know that some of these new technologies are now available. What stands in the way of getting those to vulnerable communities sooner? Uh, thank you, Joost, and uh, uh, our distinguished uh, panelists here have adequately uh, uh, stated the need in the region that is quite uh, significantly different from uh, Asia, I mean, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or other parts of the world where malaria and other vector-borne diseases are spread. Uh, from innovation to introduction uh, of the product in the country, there, is, there are many challenges. And one of the key challenges that we see in, region, in this region is the regulatory pathways. Uh, IBCC had done uh, a, a pathway analysis, uh, which was commissioned by DFAT, in trying to understand what are the challenges that are there in Asia Pacific region, generally as an overview, and uh, especially on a few countries that we have done this uh, a, a deep dive to understand the challenges that are there in the regulatory pathways. And, uh, uh, what the analysis have brought forth that uh, the regulatory mechanisms and the processes in the region is quite fragmented. There are countries which have got very good uh, registration power processes existing, and there are countries where it is completely unregulated. And moving from uh, a region which has got uh, process with, with no specifications or guidelines existing exclusively for uh, vector control tools, getting a product into the market is going to be, uh, it, it, might, it might lead to spurious products coming into the market, plus other uh, you know, quality issues. But we also seen that there is no transparency existing in the, in the entire registration process. There is, uh, there is a need for uh, local uh, uh, duplication of trials and work that gets uh, duplicated across in different countries. Uh, there are countries which, have, which, have, which do accept uh, regional trial data, uh, thereby easing the introduction of the product into the country. There, are, there is an issue with capacity of testing new products, uh, capabilities of analyzing these new products in the market and introducing it across to, across the, across to, uh, to the end users. And, um, and most importantly, the engagement with the regulator and the transparency of this, this entire process needs to be revamped across. And uh, uh, so, so if I may state it, it's more to do with uniform guidelines, which is not existing. There is this uh, issue of transparency. We would need to have more transparent engagement with the uh, regulator and the registrant, plus the other uh, uh, stakeholders in the entire process. And uh, ultimately, when the product is registered and taken into the market, we need to have a quality assurance system. Post-registration quality assurance is absolutely important to uh, have the quality of products to be introduced in the market. So there is this plethora of uh, issues that are surrounding from innovation to introduction, which needs to be addressed to have uh, uh, the goal elimination goals to be uh, uh, undertaken. And one of the things that we see the, that the mosquito is evolving a lot. So we need to have regulatory mechanisms also evolving along to have new products introduced seamlessly into the marketplace. Thank you. Thank, thank you, John Paul. And I think this uh, regulatory landscaping study is available for download in your chat box. So Tessa, once again, back to you. In the Pacific Islands, what are some of the issues in terms of accessing vector control products and how are the Pacific Islands working around it? Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. I think we recently had a very uh, prime example, a uh, very devastating event here, which gives a good indication of what some of the challenges are to Pacific Island countries. Um, in early April this year, we had a Category 5 cyclone that struck uh, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, Fiji and Tonga uh, that absolutely left a path of decimation. Half the population of Vanuatu were in areas significantly affected. Health systems were destroyed, uh, health facilities were destroyed, other public services were interrupted. Um, a humanitarian effort was mounted, but there were really significant delays in getting in the critical humanitarian equipment and supplies, largely due to the COVID-19 border restrictions that have been imposed. Um, in Vanuatu, the areas that were the worst hit were the areas that continue to carry the major burden of malaria in the country, so Sanma and Malampa provinces. We had malaria detected in those areas. We also had dengue outbreaks that occurred 
uh, after the cyclone. So we really critically did need to get in some of the emergency supplies to conduct IRS. It was a major, major challenge. Um, we managed to reprogram some global fund long lasting nets to the, the areas that were the most severely affected, but we really did struggle to bring in any of this really critical emergency supplies for the vector control response. So based on this, um, a number of years ago, the WHO Division of Pacific Technical Support in Fiji had established a stockpile of vector control supplies and equipment. And this was meant to meet the needs of small Pacific Island nations, particularly in emergency situations. Uh, we're glad to uh, have the support of the Australian government through the Pacific Infectious Disease Prevention Program to be able to restock that supply uh, starting fairly soon. And through this, we do hope to be able to provide necessary supplies rapidly to get them to where they're needed, particularly on the back of all of these uh, natural disasters that continue to plague a lot of the small Pacific Island countries. Thanks, Tessa. So now that we are delving a little bit deeper into access to new bed nets, hammock nets, spatial repellents, and other vector control tools, Camilla, can you tell us a little bit more about the center's role in supporting the introduction of new vector control products in the Asia, in Asia and in the Pacific? Certainly, just um, you know, a bit earlier, I mentioned that we have an investment in IVCC as one of our um, broader investments in product development partnerships, and something that we've been um, really becoming more aware of, along with other funders of so-called PDPs, is that importance of of access and of bridging the gap from development and introduction into markets. And that goes across all products, not just vector control products, but um, you know, John Paul mentioned the regulatory landscaping study, the other landscaping work that was done by IVCC recently. And that made it really apparent that this is a, this is a real challenge that we face. Um, you know, I think for, and particularly for this region, um, which where it's, it's quite complicated, um, there's um, in some, some countries a very large private sector market to consider. Um, and so what we've, what we've seen, what we've learned from our experience, um, particularly within DFAT um, on work in relation to the introduction of new medicines is that that landscape is really complicated. It's really complex. Um, and that in particular, there is, um, you know, there's a need to understand a wide range of factors in order to be able to ensure introduction you need to understand, you need to have a good um, understanding of the, in this case, the entomological landscape of what's your um, disease burdens. So you need to have really good surveillance systems. You need to understand those market dynamics. We need to understand safety and policy guidelines and the regulatory systems that exist. Um, and we need to make sure that the work that's going in um, early up in, in relation to development of, of new tools and new products that will eventually need to be introduced that the needs and the preferences of the users are really taken into account early on. So that's something that um, we have, you know, in our minds when we're looking at um, working with IVCC, with WMP, with whoever other partners, that those, that, that thinking about how is this, how is this going to play out? You know, the science is really complicated. We need to get the science right, but what is it going to mean when we actually try to get it to people and get people to use it? Um, so, it's quite a dynamic space. This is another reason why we're um, we're interested in the work that VCAP is is pulling together and is trying to strengthen that ecosystem. So we're really working closely with VCAP to try to understand that better and to understand and to um, inject that understanding and that forward-looking approach into our other investments um, that are more upstream. Thanks, Camilla. And we were also able to ask Dr. Sif in Cambodia via video a little bit about the delivery challenges to reach population at risk. So maybe we can hear from Dr. Sif again by video. I think it's a very short answer. To uh, provide the correct back to them. Um, we had been the first, we need to identify the, the hotspot where we are the mostly entry point that uh, uh, mobile people go in and go out in, in that in order to go to the forest, before to go to the forest. So after we, we map this out and we need to, to set uh, every entry point, we need to set, uh, they call mobile malaria worker. The, the mobile malaria worker, um, we will provide them training and equip with the diagnosis treatment and also the protecting tool 
like a forex pack. So every time that people pass by their entry point, um, the, the, they need to, to craft the mobile uh, malware worker and the mobile malware worker will be uh, get some interview with them, just a short interview in order to make sure that they are uh, go to work and sleep in the forest. So when, when the, the forest go identified, the forest pack will be uh, delivered uh, to the mobile people through the uh, mobile malware worker. So um, uh, through the channel, we can uh, uh, capture um, most like most of uh, mobile people that likely go to the forest. Recently, in 2019, we are uh, distributed more than 10,000 of forest pack to the, the, the forest work, uh, forest goer. And uh, beside that, we also have a system how how to track these people when they are going back as well. Because we, we know that it's not easy to track the mobile or forest goer. But we have a, a system that uh, every forest goer, they will really say uh, the forest pack. Inside the forest pack, there is a repellent, one, one bottle of repellent. So they need to come back and to replace repellent when they are empty their bottle. So um, the, the refillment of a repellent to the forest goer this is a chance to us that meet the, the forest go again um, in order to, to take some information from them and to uh, and also provide the additional repellent to refill for them. So there is a, a chance that that's a more of a forest go can come back to see the, the malaria worker. So I think that uh, only through this channel we can cover the most of the, the forest go in the, uh, the context of uh, elimination okay. right now. Thank you very much, Dr. Sif, uh, for, for recording the answers with us. So we have heard from Cambodia on ways to identify, track, and continuously protect mobile migrant communities from malaria transmission. Now, Dr. Afsana, how does Bangladesh engage the high-risk community for vector control? Uh, thank you, Josh. Uh, we, we just lost uh, the other time uh, for my poor connection. So um, uh, maybe I'll answer this uh, really short. Uh, like we, you, uh, I already mentioned you that the 90% of the ethnic people who are coming from the uh, Chittagong Hill districts where the most of the cases are coming. So we, the National Malaria Elimination Program of Bangladesh government, uh, they vows to ensure quality access um, to the treatment and prevention services, irrespective of um, ethnicity or gender, especially for the most vulnerable and hard to reach population. So the ethnic people are the majority of the number of people. I just inform you that the 90% of the people are coming from. And the community leaders uh, who are uh, working in the forest, they are the headman and the karubari, we said. Uh, and of these uh, group, the, mm, uh, the groups are communicated and consultant before taking any kind of interventions. We, we discuss with them, uh, including vector control of these areas. Uh, the whole local community is also involved um, during the implementation of the regular vector controls. Uh, they also take part as uh, you know, like paid volunteers uh, when we distribute L Alliance or other things. Uh, so we take them uh, to uh, maybe for larvicide, larvicidal activities, for indoor res residual spray. We took those local people um, along with us. Um, just to let you know that uh, in the new uh, national strategic uh, um, uh, plan, uh, 2021 to 2023, uh, we introduce uh, a new thing that is called the uh, community engagement. Uh, what does it mean? No, the community engagement is like the we, we take the leaders, uh, the community leaders or the local elites uh, in, in that, that thing. Uh, the purpose of uh, forming this committee is to um, identify the high risk groups. Uh, there are mobile population like people are coming in the bordering areas, the cross, cross border areas. There are mobile people or mobile uh, population are coming. Uh, maybe some people is coming from one district to another. So new household people are there. And uh, so, someone is recently pregnant. You know, this. these are the high-risk people, pregnant women, and under five 
uh, aged children, they are our risk communities. So while we are distributing the L lines or doing the mapping of the larva or doing the indoor residual spray. So this is the new committee we, we are just proposing that in our, uh, in our uh, national strategic plan in 2021 to 2023. So maybe by this we can uh, engage uh, more people communication and also uh, to control the vector control in high risk uh, community uh, group and the global fund is funding us um, really they, they are like uh, giving us from 2010 till now they are funding for only for malaria and this is um, this is really a good thing for uh, the national program to have a, a, a good uh, good backing process uh, under global fund and also WHO is there, their technical advisors are always communicating with us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Afsana. So let's have a quick moment uh, with a look at some of the materials that was developed in collaboration with our industry partners to create a repository of easy information cards on, on different projects that are available, available in Asia and the Pacific and could be of interest uh, for the region. There are, it's just a, a snapshot of the product, uh, social media cards that are available through Applema, IVCC and RBM Twitter accounts. These will be hosted online as well as a permanent resource of information after this round table. So it's just a quick preview. Yeah, so you, you can see these cards. Um, if you're very fast, you might get your QR code, but I think um, the organizers will make it available to everybody who is registered. And um, so let's uh, continue then right away. And um, as you know, this session is co-hosted by the Vector Control in the Asia Pacific Platform or VCAP. So members of VCAP identi identified uh, several challenges that slow down access, including regulatory approval of vector control tools. But there are also some great lessons to be learned from across the region. And I'm very pleased to have Dr. Joel on the panel who was listening patiently and you haven't heard his voice yet, who can tell us more about the experience of Singapore in this space. Uh, Dr. Joel, Singapore has a very efficient process for the registration of vector control tools. Can you provide us with a short overview of this process? Um, hi, Joost. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to uh, the event organizers for inviting me uh, today. Uh, now, in Singapore, the registration of all pesticides and repellents re related to vector control um, is mandated by law. Uh, whether it's meant for sale, supply or advertisement, um, all these products need to be registered. Um, and it's also a requirement that only locally registered businesses um, are allowed to apply for registration. Now, product development timelines are really long. And so we've tried our best to ensure that the application process um, is relatively straightforward and doesn't impede the availability of a good product. Because the submission of several documents is required, and we understand the anxiety that some applicants may experience, uh, we've produced a comprehensive guideline, and this is available online, um, to help applicants through their journey. Um, once we receive uh, the full set of requisite documents, uh, processing usually takes about an average of about um, maybe three months uh, for products with previously registered active ingredients. Um, and for novel products, uh, it might take a longer timeline, uh, usually about nine months on average. Uh, now, in between, there may be some clarification sought and requests for additional data. Uh, and we do try our best to communicate this as quickly as possible uh, because applicants might take uh, more time. Uh, to obtain that information. Um, and once the product is uh, successfully registered, uh, it will then be added to a public list of registered products. Uh, and this list is uh, available on our agency website for free. Uh, now all products will feature a unique registration number um, as well as a registration logo. Uh, and the aim of this is to uh, give greater consumer confidence uh, that a product wasn't made in someone's backyard. Um, so on this list that's publicly available, um, applicants, um, retailers, and consumers alike uh, can access this information uh, to inform their choices and their decisions. Thank you, Dr. Joel. Quick second question. 
I mean, this series is about innovation, the Malaria Game Changer series. Can you share with us some really innovative approaches to vector control? I'm thinking of the Volbachia bacteria for control, controlling uh, dengue transmission, for example. What can we learn from the trials taking place in Singapore? And what is the approach a technology like this should take? Uh, well, Joost, um, you know, a safe and efficacious vaccine for everyone would really represent an advancement in controlling dengue. Um, but honestly, that may be a moonshot for settings that are resource poor. Uh, meanwhile, many health authorities, um, they would have to rely on vector control as the primary disease um, control measure. Now, Wolbachia is a naturally occurring bacterium. And if you had a banana or an apple or some fruit salad this morning, you might have just consumed it. Um, it's really a novel control measure that is gaining um, a lot of prominence, um, especially in Southeast Asia, where the dengue health burden um, is relatively high. Now, the beauty of the 80s Wolbachia technology is that uh, although it's aimed at reducing dengue, but really can also address yellow fever, uh, chikungunya, and also Zika, which are carried by the 80s Egypti mosquito. Um, previous field studies um, in Singapore have shown that uh, Wolbachia uh, can reduce the population of 80s Egypti mosquitoes uh, by about 80%. Uh, and in Malaysia, we've heard uh, from Dr. Rose that uh, there were some epidemiological studies. Um, and this was a study that was published last year and showed that uh, Wolbachia uh, was successful in reducing dengue transmission uh, by as much as 40% um, in relation to control sites that did not have the Wolbachia intervention. Um, one thing we've learned about uh, in Singapore, as well as uh, what we've um, heard from some of our colleagues uh, in the region, is that uh, community support uh, is quite essential uh, to the success of the 80s Wolbachi technology. Um, so it's not a silver bullet. Uh, it can't cure um, um, a place of a, a dengue outbreak that's ongoing. Um, so members of the community, they still have to look for stagnant water. Uh, they can breed mosquitoes and remove them. Um, also without community support, uh, it's, it would be very, very challenging um, to release the mosquitoes and to monitor mosquito activity levels um, without um, community interference. Um, so we need the support of the community. Uh, we need the support of a community leadership as well uh, and quite a number of stakeholders uh, in order for this uh, intervention uh, to achieve its maximum effectiveness. Over to you, Joost. Thank you, Dr. Joel. Um, Malaysia is close to Singapore, so Dr. Rose, can you tell us about the role of the Ministry of Health in regulating vector control tools in Malaysia? And what other stakeholders does uh, the Ministry of Health collaborate with when introducing innovative vector control products in the market? Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Josh. Uh, in Malaysia, all insecticides uh, use as co either as commercial product or vector control products, uh, they must be registered and they are also regulated by the Department of Agriculture under the Pesticide Act 1974. So we have an act uh, to control this pesticide use in Malaysia. The, we have a pesticide board under the Ministry of Agriculture. is responsible for implementing and enforcing this act. And the pesticide board is also responsible for carrying out post-registration and also to monitor the pesticides in the market. So Ministry of Health is one of the uh, member in the pesticide board. So uh, it's a multi-agency uh, in, uh, involvement in this pesticide board. Uh, there is a study done in Malaysia and it is pu uh, published in the uh, vector control platform in Asia Pacific in the VCAP website, so please visit. Um, and you can read more on this study. And in terms of collaboration, uh, Ministry of Health is also collaborating with Institute of Medical Research, or IMR, uh, and University of Science Malaysia uh, in performing research according to the program needs. So example, looking into the effectiveness of the new products and uh, or, or new methods that is being used by the program manager. Apart from that, we also collaborate with the University of Queensland with our uh, Wolbachia project, and it is very successful. 
Ministry of Health is also collaborating with private sector uh, in producing innovative uh, product, example product which is uh, weather resistance and also long lasting for outdoor residual spray, for example, polyzone. So this is the collaboration that we have in our country. Thank you, Dr. Rose. And uh, when, when I look at the time, I'm seeing that we are um, running out of time. So definitely it's becoming complicated to have a Q and A and I got the uh, um, green light. All the questions you have put in the chat as participants um, the, the organizers will try to make ensure you get an answer from the person you have addressed. So they will try to facilitate that. I have another two questions and then we still have a short wrap up. So hopefully you can stay, uh, stay with us another five to 10 minutes more. But uh, let me go straight over to John Paul. Um, we have discussed the finding from your report. What were some of the recommendations suggested to strengthen regulatory pathways to to introducing vector control products, John Paul. Uh, thank you, Joost. And uh, listening to what uh, Singapore and Malaysia say, uh, it's absolutely, uh, you know, the kind of engagement that they have with the registrant and the uh, National Malaria Program is absolutely important. One of the important things that we need to identify in the region is to, is to re, uh, you know, uh, ramp up the regulatory process is a, uh, is a collaborative approach. You know, countries which are kind of unregulated in their uh, regulatory processes and countries which have got good practices, they'll have to exchange. You know, countries which have good practices will have to engage with countries which are trying to build up the regulatory system, a more collaborative approach, kind of sharing of work between countries, joint reviews. All these are, uh, all these are principles which are already existing. It is just that we need to try and adopt it for the region and uh, more of work sharing, more, more of joint reviews, uh, a collaborative approach. That's, that's what the WCAP platform intends to do. And, uh, and, and it's a very good initiative that has been taken by Appleman. And, uh, you know, uh, another thing that we also look at it is acceptance of data. If you have done a trial in the region and it is more acceptable, like Malaysia does accept data, which is uh, regional data that has been generated, efficacy data that has been generated in the region. Certain countries are insisting upon conducting long-term trials, which drag the introduction of the product into the market. And that is one, uh, you know, one sure way of trying to expedite the process of getting a registration done. Uh, Singapore has got time-bound registration uh, timelines, and that is, and and they engage with the regula re registrant more, trying to guide them in the process. New innovative products are encouraged by Malaysia and Singapore to come into the market. Then you have uh, Thailand experience where there is a kind of an interaction which happens between different stakeholders. So all these are different kinds of mechanisms in which a, a regulatory process could be revamped and strengthened. At the same time, being, being protective in the registration, which is important, but at the same time being more enabling and taking the products into the market. And one of the things that I would like to emphasize more is on the fact that we need to have a strong post-registration quality management to ensure that the products that are reaching to the consumer is, is of good quality. So these are some of the uh, important steps that we can do. And we can also think about, uh, you know, using collaborative approaches, which WHO has in terms of the accelerated collaborative registration process, where countries can sign in and have that more, uh, you know, implemented in the region. Thank, Thank you, you, John Paul. Justin, from a manufacturer's perspective, what are the challenges and opportunities that you see for introducing new tools in, in Asia and the Pacific? Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting listening to some of the, the former comments because it kind of supports and echoes some of the things I'm about to say. I think um, there was a word transparency which was used earlier, I think by John Paul. Um, and I think one of the challenges actually links to that, and that's not necessarily within the regulatory process because some, some countries are very good. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's very good regulatory systems in some countries. But I think one of the challenges is, of course, that if, if a product is needed today, then from a manufacturer's perspective, we needed to start thinking about putting a dossier together in the registration process three to five years ago. So if there's a short-term need for a product today, it's already too late. So, so I think some of that transparency also comes to how do we better link that timeline and pathway for the regulatory process with the anticipated demand for that type of product in the range of countries where it's going to be needed. And I think if we've got such a tight 
timeline for elimination goal of 2030, and that is really something which should be thought about in terms of what are the what are the scope or the range of countries for which product category X, Y, Z is going to be needed in period whatever, so that that planning can be put in place. Because I think there's there's you know our, our companies sort of uh, have a dedicated regulatory departments which you know spend their entire days working on dossiers and and the elements of safety, efficacy, and quality are inherent in, in things that we do in, in Sumitomo, in Syngenta, BSF, and other many other companies. So, so that is our bread and butter, and that's very much what we do. Um, so there is the capacity to do that, but I think it's it's often basically kind of fitting all those needs in amongst a range of demands for other you know other parts of that resource in terms of that regulatory science base. So. So there is that link to transparency of forecasting, which I think aligning with regulatory pathways and, and a harmonized pathway where, as, as, as John Paul just very eloquently highlighted, I think this, this need for specific biology studies in countries where there's already an existing evidence base can add an additional time and, and resource demand, which makes it yeah, more difficult to, to make such tools available. Thank you, I'll Justin. Thanks. Yeah. So first, a big thanks to, to all the speakers to answering my, my questions here. Um, as I said before, um, APELMA Secretariat will help to facilitate that if you have asked a specific question and if you were clear who you have addressed, we try to facilitate the answers because we made a big promise that we're gonna have Q and A. And uh, I think I must admit, I won't be able to, to keep this promise because we have uh, one more person who was recorded for a few minutes because we asked uh, one colleague, um, um, Dr. Dia Batev, uh, he is a principal investigator of Target Malaria, which is a not-for-profit research consortium working in Sub-Saharan Africa to develop and share technology for malaria control. So this is still coming up and then we would like to have a two minute sum up by one of our colleagues. So hopefully you can stay with us a few more minutes, but uh, before I'm too rushed, once again, all speakers, thank you very much for doing an excellent job and being patient because sometimes you had to wait quite a while and apology to our, all our participants who, um, who have engaged very much in the chat box. I keep an eye on, on the chat box in the other um, Zoom room and they have shared a lot of information and knowledge uh, we were unfortunately not all able to see. So. Um, I would like to request to, to play Dr. Diapate's uh, video message on innovations in being implemented in Africa. Okay, great. Uh, many thanks for the invitation. I'm uh, Abdullah Diabate. I'm a medical entomologist from l'Institut de Recherche en Sciences de la Santé here in Burkina Faso. I'm also the principal investigator of the Project Target Malaria here in Burkina Faso. So as I already mentioned, I'm a medical entomologist, so I will answer your question, you know, from the perspective of medical entomologists. Retrospectively, looking at the death toll of vector bone disease, and specifically malaria, we have come from really, really far away. From 2 million cases per year, we have come down to less than 500,000 cases great achievement, but still, to me, these are a few thousand too many. Let's not get into the battle of statistics here. Bottom line is that we need game-changing intervention tools that can help us really to overcome the evolutionary risk challenges that we are facing with mosquitoes in the field. And Target Malaria is committed to take this challenge. We are a not-for-profit uh, research consortium. Our ultimate goal is to develop and share with the world a sustainable and cost-effective genetic control tool that will help us to control most of the population in the field and ultimately to have a big impact on malaria transmission. The recent advances in genome editing give us an unparalleled opportunity today to be able to develop and share with the world you know, the gene drive technology that will be able to suppress multiple population in the field and ultimately save millions of lives. We believe in it and we really feel that this is the way to go. And whenever the technology is ready, 
and all the regulatory and public acceptance issues are solved, we think that the technology will be able to be deployed anywhere in the world. But we need to start anticipating to prepare the ecosystem of vector control in Africa for that. Now, how do we really make sure that this technology can be rolled out really, really easily and quickly in Africa? I think that there are three key elements that we need to work on. The first one is the regulatory aspect. The second one will be the uh, public acceptance aspect. And then the third one is the capacity building. So strong regulation is key element you know, to public acceptance. For the kind of technology that we are developing, we must say that mosquitoes do really not need a visa to travel from one country to another. So it's extremely important for us to build a strong and robust regulatory system across the landscape of malaria transmission in Africa. And I believe that the NIPA, which is a technical branch of the African Union, is working toward that. But also, you have uh, regional bodies like SIMS that are really doing a fantastic job on the field, trying to regulate you know, new incoming vector control tools, such as the next generation of LIA. The second aspect uh, is uh, related you know, to the public acceptance. I think that full transparency and trust in whatever we are doing are really key element to public acceptance. It will not take anyone a PhD to understand that we as scientists are respectful to their values and also believe. So we need to adopt a strong and inclusive stakeholder engagement with all our communities and also the policymakers to build trust. And then the third element is capacity building. African scientists really need to be equipped with the theoretical and practical skills to be able to explain and run this technology on their own. On this ground, I must say that Target Malaria, along with uh, you know, various uh, partners such as PAMCA, FNIH and IBCC are doing a fantastic job on the ground. We also have recently built a center of excellence from the World Bank funded project. Uh, this is committed you know, to build a critical mass of next generation African scientists you know, uh, to tackle the vector bone disease. And this is the only way we'll be able you know, to eliminate malaria in Africa. So, this is actually, we're coming to the end of our, our session. And as every time we invited one commentator, one person to help us to sum up the round table discussion with a few key takeaways or key messages. And I invite Dr. Alexandra Cameron. She's a senior technical manager of the strategy team of unit aid and a member of the VCAP secretariat to sum up the round table discussion in the form of maybe three key messages. Dr. Alexander, over to you. Thank you very much, Joost. Hello, everyone. Um, so I have a very ambitious task. It's been a, a really rich set of, of interventions and discussions, but I'll do my best to pull out a few key messages. I think you know the the first thing that struck me was just um, the range of tools that are available, uh, both currently and in the pipeline, uh, to address some of the key challenges in the Asia Pacific region, um, outdoor biting and also insecticide resistance and that we need not one tool, but we need a variety of tools available that can meet the needs of the local context. Um, and I note particularly the idea of bringing back some tools that existed and were used before, such as in the Pacific Islands, bringing back IRS uh, as one of the approaches there. Number two, I think um, the richness of the pipeline and the new tools that are under development is something that is very striking uh, and very encouraging, um, especially considering some of the challenging market environments and market issues that innovators face uh, in bringing these tools to market. So then the question becomes, how can we ensure these products are available uh, when they're safe and effective? And how can they be introduced as quickly as possible to reach those in need and contribute to the elimination agenda in the region? Um, and here there was a, a variety of different elements that were discussed with respect to bridging the gap between product development and uh, deployment or access. Um, one being 
Uh, of course, an important one being streamlining the regulatory and policy pathways. And there were a number of, of really interesting examples that were provided in that respect and ideas such as accepting trial data um, that's generated in the region and leveraging the WHO collaborative approach to registration. Uh, two, understanding the market dynamics and, and thinking about a holistic view of the market, including the private sector. Another thing that was mentioned several times was around the role of communities uh, and ensuring that um, products respond to community demand and that communities participate uh, in that process. And then a fourth one, I think, was a you know, broader concept around integration, looking at um, integrating across different vector-borne diseases and taking a, a whole of government approach. And then finally, another element I think that came up multiple times was around information transparency, uh, access to information and information sharing. And here I just want to flag again the VCAP website and the VCAP platform more broadly. Um, and you know, we really created this platform and website as a means to contribute to, to greater information sharing and greater transparency. So we encourage everyone to uh, visit the website and, and participate actively. It is a um, an interactive uh, approach with forums and other uh, mechanisms to share information. So uh, we really are um, thinking about this as a more interactive platform rather than a, a one-way information exchange. So um, with that, I know I'm probably already over time, so I'll, uh, I'll end there and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Alexandra. And I saw in the chat, many people have already uh, given comments on the website and they were very, very positive. So um, this is it for today. So I hope uh, our audience had an interesting takeaway from our second edition of the Malaria Game Changer series, this, this time on the vector control tools. There are more uh, coming up. I think the next one is actually during the virtual Malaria Week 2020, which will be held from the 7th to the 11th September. And our uh, next uh, Malaria Game Changers will be in this week on the 10th of September, but please take note, 7th to 11th September, the government of Vietnam together with Appelma and Upman will host a virtual Malaria Week, and there will be also some opportunities for everybody to engage again, including the next edition of this series. So thanks to all our speakers and audience. Have a good day, stay safe, stay healthy, and hope to see many of you during Malaria Week. So, and bye-bye everybody.